My name is Sarah Stewart, and I've been the, the SOAS co-convener since, um, since the outset of the series. We are, of course, indebted to the suit of our family uh, for this series, uh, as it's built up over the years and has become a flagship of SOAS events uh, annually. And in particular, we, particular we thank Mrs. Fatima um, Sudavar for her continued uh, involvement in the series and her advice and working um, with all of us uh, to take it forward. Um, I should say that today um, we're going to miss uh, Mr. Abulala Sudavar and his um, lively presence in the proceedings and uh, wish him a speedy recovery. Um, as you know, the, this series is hosted by the LMEI, the London Middle East Institute, and its director, uh, Dr. Hassan Hakimian, who's here, here today, of course. Um, it was from the LMEI that uh, the Centre for Iranian Studies was established in 2010. And that, of course, focuses entirely on Iran events. There are a great many of them. You only have to check into the website. Um, and there are all the usual social media um, channels for it, announcing what it does. And uh, indeed, in your um, conference pack today, there is a one of the um, Middle East in London magazine issues, which is devoted to Iran. So that's a nice thing to have for today's event. Um, now, before I introduce, um, well, the main convener of this, of this series, Professor Charles Melville, um, I'd just like to draw your attention to the fire escapes, which are on either side. So in the event of a fire alarm, please make your way to one or other of them, and then up the stairs. Um, and there is one pro slight programme change. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter for now, but after lunch, um, we have only given um, uh, Dr Dan Sheffield half an hour instead of three quarters of an hour. That's a mistake. Of course, he will have three quarters of an hour, which will push the tea break um, forward a little bit by 15 minutes. Uh, so now it just remains for me to welcome Professor Charles Melville, who will talk to you about this particular um, series. And uh, Professor Melville is pre president of, of the British Institute for Persian Studies, BIPS, and also the director of the Shahnameh Project at Cambridge. So welcome to you all, in particular, our wonderful lineup of speakers. And I'll turn over to Charles. Thank you, Sarah. Well, uh, very briefly from me, because uh, we de need to get started. Um, first of all, to reiterate, uh, the thanks of Sarah to Fatima Sudava and also uh, to uh, the team who have allowed this event to take place at all, uh, which takes a surprising amount of organising. Um, you'll be glad to hear that even I don't think we can call the Safavid period an intermezzo. I know that this aroused a lot of confusion when I tried to say the Timurid period was an intermezzo last year. But uh, in fact, of course, the Safavids um, lasted longer than any other dynasty since the Sasanians. And uh, it's a very long period, so much so, in fact, that it's been very difficult to try to uh, uh, encapsulate what one might think about Iran and what was going on in the Safavid period into one day. And the plan at the moment is to have a second day in May next year, partly because a lot of people who were invited to come this time can't come. And you'll see from the program there's a certain focus uh, on the uh, one aspect or one or two aspects of the Safavid period today. We're a bit lacking in some departments, especially uh, Iran's relations with her neighbors, by which I particularly mean Central Asia and India, and uh, various other topics. So uh, nevertheless, we have a very full uh, day, nine papers, I think, is uh, another innovation. Um, and I'm looking forward myself to seeing and hearing um, my colleagues and friends give their uh, presentations. 
Uh, I'd like to apologize to Negar for being the only lady on the program. Some people have already noticed, some more violently than others, that it's a male-dominated event today. But of course, this is not deliberate, and I'm sure the balance will be redressed <laughs> at the next one. Um, I'd like to just very briefly, since we're talking about Iran and the idea of Iran and, uh, and some of the people who've contributed so much to this, who've passed away in, uh, recently, um, especially Esan Yashater, who essentially was in the embodiment of the idea of Iran himself, I think, with his incredible um, energy and love for the culture and history of his country and the work he did, which set the, set the foundation for so much subsequent and continuing scholarship. And Gilbert Lazar, also another of the Buzurgan, who did so much for uh, Persian language and literature. And more recently, Lenny Lewison, who so suddenly and unexpectedly died in uh, America while running, or having finished running. I've always thought running was a very bad idea. I don't run myself. Uh, so um, just to remember their contributions briefly and think that we're all being able to build on the work they've done in the past. Uh, so without more ado, our first session is dominated by questions of history and historiography. And um, I think we, it's best if we have questions at the end of each paper. Uh, I certainly prefer this myself. So we'll uh, have about 30 minutes or so and then time for some questions, 35 minutes that time for some questions. I'm going to chair the first session and I hope set an example of rigorous timekeeping uh, uh, to the extent of coming up and hauling people who go over the, their time off the podium. But I know that won't be necessary. And I'd like to first of all introduce uh, Ali Anusha, who... Um, has come from America and who's working on Indo-Persian historians. He has an article coming up shortly in the SOAS Bulletin called Indo-Persian Histories and Sindo-Persian Historians about the Torihi Masumi, um, which is about the, basically the historiographical um, productivity of Sindh. Uh, and a nice article recently in the Royal Asiatic Society Journal called The Elephant and the Sovereign in India, around about 1,000. So he's working very much in the field of um, Persian studies and um, Persian connections with India. So over to you, Ali. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Sudavar Foundation uh, for sponsoring the conference and SOAS for hosting it, Charles Melville and uh, Sarah Stewart for inviting me, and I have to, I'd like to thank Vincenzo Pacci for getting us all here. Uh, it was a lot of hard work to coordinate everything, but uh, he worked it out really well. And I'm honored to be here, and thank you all for being here on a cold morning. I think uh, we'll channel the, the, the shivers into having a joyful and vigorous conference. Uh, so I was asked by Charles to analyze the question posed uh, by the conference uh, by looking at how Persian historians of the early 16th century dealt with the transition uh, from the Timurid to the Safavid period. Uh, so in, in other words, if the Safavids are considered to be sort of the, having laid the foundation for modern Iran, uh, how did people at the time perceive this change? So uh, Obviously, in order to do that, we have to get closely, as closely as possible to people who wrote about these events at the actual time. Uh, and there are three main uh, prose chronicles, and there's a verse chronicle that are written at about this time by people who uh, were present, at the, alive at the time, and witnessed it. And I'm going to focus on one of these texts called uh, Fotuhate Shahi by Amini Haravi, Royal Victories or Conquest. And Amini actually died in 1534. Now, at first glance, you know, we might think there's nothing special about Amini, uh, because just like his, the, the other three uh, contemporaries, Khan Damir, Hatefi, and uh, Fazullah Ruzbahan, Khonji Esfahani, Amini was uh, you know, just a Persian language author, and he was not a direct participant in the events that he wrote about. Um, and uh, you know, he wrote about it basically retrospectively. 
But there is one important fact that distinguishes him from the others, and that is the circumstances of the composition of the Chronicle. Because in the preface of his text, and this is actually, it's a big universal history that the whole text has, text has not been edited, only the part in the Safavid uh, has been edited in Iran some years ago. Um, what's unique about him is that he says in the preface that Shah Ismail himself commissioned him to write this. Uh, and in order to provide him with informants, he actually told uh, you know, whoever of the veterans of the early times of his, his battles in the early 1500s, uh, whoever had survived all this to actually go and tell him what happened. So he has oral uh, sources from uh, the people who actually witnesses. And he identifies two of them, Hossein Beg Lale and Farrokh Agha. And he says there are others who, had, uh, who were present in those battles. So we're you know, uh, talking about a composite authorship. There's, you know, they're telling him what happened, and he's turning it into a Persian rhetorical uh, narrative. So I think that sets him apart from Khan Damir and Khonji. Khan Damir actually specifically mentions uh, Futuhat, and he probably used it as a source. And Khonji Esfahani, he is writing, uh, he's very much against the Safavid, so it's, a hard, it's, a, it's not an unproblematic text. So uh, he's, he hates the Safavids, actually. Uh, based on this evidence, I can argue with the following today. There was no idea of something called Iran in this transition period. The word Iran only shows up in Amini's book twice. Uh, back to back. Once uh, it's paired with Turan, Iran and Turan, as a kind of a geographical region, meaning specifically Khorasan and Transoxania. And then again, immediately afterward, when a Rumi, Roman, uh, envoy shows up on behalf of the Ottoman emperors. And here I like to use the word Roman. If it's a little unusual, I'm referring to what we call the Ottoman Empire. But if the topic today is to look at how people perceive their own territoriality, then we shouldn't call it the Ottoman Empire, because they didn't call it that. They call it the Roman Empire, ruled by the Ottoman family. So what does this all mean? It means that as far as the people of the time were concerned, the actual participants in these events, uh, they had no idea of Iran. And this was not because they were alien or unpatriotic. In fact, they were non-patriotic, uh, because there was no patriotism. Uh, this was because they had a radically different view of territory than we do today. So in our modern uh, conception, uh, a people are defined as a nation. They own the land that they live on. And this land has a particular characteristic uh, that is shared between it and the people for all eternity, you know, way into the past, 2,500 years, 5,000 years, whatever. And so the people also have exclusive rights in the modern sense. The people, the nation, has exclusive rights of sovereignty over the land, which is exercised over it by a government that is supposed to represent them in one form or another. This conception does not exist in the 16th century. Land is essentially property. It's owned by the king and a few noble families. Uh, everybody else is considered a subject, rayat. Either the king, in some cases, the king and the nobility actually own the people, or most of the people are just renters, and they work on the land for the king or the lord or whoever. Uh, kingdoms don't have clear borders. Uh, because it's just various property that the king holds in all sorts of places. So a king might actually, and the elite, might hold uh, property over a vast area that is not contiguous. Uh, now today, our uh, practice is to sublimate territory, right? To give, kind of give this eternal value to land. And we fetishize it. But in the 16th century, it's not the land that's fetishized, but kingship. And the word kingship and kingdom are used interchangeably, padshahi, et cetera. That means that uh, not the property of the king, the land, but his body is mythologized. The body politic was actually the body of the king. And in the particular case that I'm going to talk about, uh, where land is mythologized, it's sublimated by uh, treating the areas that the king holds as a kind of heaven on earth for its inhabitants. Uh, so they're not, they're not when, when Amini writes about territory, he sublimates it by using the Quran and comparing it to heaven. He doesn't connect it to any kind of like territorial identity at all. So that means that in the case of the uh, followers of Shah Ismail, it meant that the lands ruled by their king was basically where their libidinal drives for wealth, power, sex, whatever was fulfilled. The establishment of 12 or Shiism based on this text does not seem to be that important. And then the reestablishment of a kind of ancient Persian 
empire is actually not on their agenda. Uh, again, based on the evidence that I'm using. So I'll, I'll spend a few minutes going over Amini's narrative with a particular focus on the period between 1501, which is the conquest of Tabriz, the Aquayunlu capital, by the, by the forces of Shah Ismail, and 1504, when all the Aqluyunlu territory came under control uh, by Shah Ismail and his soldiers. Um, I've written about this text earlier somewhere. I'm not going to kind of deal with that uh, too much here. But basically, uh, <clears throat> the, you know, Shah Ismail comes out of Gilan, and initially they're just kind of a band of soldiers roaming around in the Caucasus and Anatolia looking for wealth, looking for uh, people to join them. But when they conquered Tabriz, this is quite momentous because that kind of re represents the, the proper moment that a state uh, is actually formed. And so uh, I'm going to go through this, the story of how this happens for three reasons. Uh, one is because I think we'll get a better sense of uh, Shah Ismail's conquest as it develops. It's very clear from the narrative, to me anyway, that it's uh, quite unplanned and basically opportunistic. They're not out there to really do anything on purpose, it just things come, opportunities arise and they take advantage of it. Uh, second, we'll see how geography is actually discussed. And again, it doesn't seem to be a pre-planned agenda at all. And thirdly, we can kind of see how they insert the religious language at particular cases to talk about uh, what, how they understand the area that they're controlling. So let's begin. <clears throat> so the events uh, surrounding the conquest of Tabriz are worth looking at. Uh, and this is how Amini describes it. So there's a battle that takes place between Shah Ismail's soldiers and Sultan Alvan of Qoyunlu outside of Nakhchivan, which is today in Azer the Republic of Azerbaijan, uh, summer of 1501. And immediately once they win this battle, uh, Shah Ismail begins to move south uh, towards Tabriz, the capital, because now it's, there's nobody standing between him and the city. And the distance today on the map, if you take the most direct route, is about 100 miles. Uh, you go through Nakhchivan, Jolfa, Maran, and then you get to Tabriz. And uh, this should take about 33, hour, uh, 33 hours, three miles per hour, uh, which you could do in about three days. Ten, ten, you, you could do a 10-hour march. Uh, sorry, yeah, 10-hour march, 33 hours a day gets you there in three days. So now this is how Amini describes this. Is along the way, first, all the important people of the city and the surrounding countryside come out to offer uh, official welcome to their new king. These include Sayyids, judges, Qazian, uh, peasant headmen, Katkhoda, uh, guild leaders, sort of crafts and so on, and merchants, Tujar. And then Ismail meets with the Sayyids and the jurists who were, quote, uh, embellished with obedience to the 12 Imams. The author claims that Ismail actually helped these men nullify all the errors towards which their belief had gravitated Ismail is 12 years old at this point, which is probably pretty unlikely. Um, anyhow, but uh, because they had been influenced by miscreants, Ahl Khalaf. Then, I think this part is, uh, it's very short, but I think it's very important. With the help of other ulema who have now joined his camp during the march to Tabriz, they arranged the sermon in the proper, meaning 12-er, uh, Shiite manner. This is important because we're used to thinking of Shah Ismail showing up in Tabriz, and then forcing everybody to uh, follow 12 or Shiism and everybody's a Sunni Muslim. That's not what, how Amini describes it at all. It looks like that the Shiite ulama actually come out and join him, and then they kind of work out what the sermon should be. And at that point, they force everybody else, ahl Khalaf, to kind of follow it. Okay? So they're establishing the symbolic aspect of the new rule, which is the Friday sermon. Uh, it's... From this account, the mass conversion that we read about later does not take place, where they're forced, I mean, what kind of conversion is it? They're forced to curse the four caliphs at the pain of death. Uh, this doesn't, I mean, he doesn't talk about this. The, the goal seems to be co-opting a minimum number of collaborating members of the religious and legal elite. Um, and this, I would argue, reflects the perspective of those early veterans who were in the camp when this is happening because uh, they're not really all that interested in substantial religious change. So in some ways, based on this account, it seems like it's the ulama and the Sayyids of Tabriz that use Shah Ismail to reconfigure the power structure in the city, not the other way around. Now, so this is in the summer of 1501. Uh, fall arrives, so they think it's going to get cold pretty soon up in the mountains. So they wait out the cold season. 
And then during the winter, according to Amini, they spent, the winter was spent in countless sessions of revelry and pleasure that lasted well into the night. At night, he writes, the city looked like a flower garden, blooming with the red color of wine and torch flame. The destitute soldiers who had gambled and joined the teenage Ismail in the previous year uh, were now able to reap the benefits of their wager. Uh, Ismail's sojourn would also profit the city. As seen above, these sol uh, this, I guess I mentioned, I guess I didn't mention it. Uh, once, every time Esmail wins an early battle, it's very it's emphatic that he does not keep any of the plunder for himself. He always gives it away. So all these soldiers now have uh, treasure in their pockets, and now they can spend it in the town markets, which is what they do. So then they complete the cycle of rapid circulation of cash. Uh, finally, there's a brief mention of ministers and deputies who are appointed to manage the affairs. Very sort of off-the-cuff remark. Uh, Amini does not specify what specific administrative tasks were seen to by these men. As we saw above, the narrative of these events was recounted to him by the top commanders who were busy performing the rites of revelry, Rosume Ishrat. Um, now, while they're doing this, there are spies and informants that are sent all over the region in search of news. And uh, they hear that the recently defeated Aqmiyunlu prince, Alvand, uh, is out in the mountains. So when spring arrives, these individuals return, and uh, they tell him that he's in Azerbaijan and getting ready for battle. So this time, Ismail personally leads his army in pursuit in the direction of Arzenjan, which is in eastern Turkey today. Um, and, uh, but it doesn't really lead to much. It's a kind of a cat and mouse game where they kind of follow, run it, uh, follow each other and nothing comes out of it. Um, and uh, after a while, Alvan runs away and uh, Ismail and his men kind of wait out a little bit in the town of Turjan, again, Eastern Anatolia. Uh, and then they release their pent up energy by engaging in a hunt on a large scale. Uh, beginning with several rounds of falconry by the king and ending with the slaughter of large quarries of deer, onagers, and gazelles by the soldiers. And then they stop in Baku, which is where the main treasury of the Aqmiyunli was. They fill up their pockets and they return to Tabriz and they spend the next cold season in drinking, revelry, and justice. Now, so there's two years that go by. This is, brings us to 1503. And uh, the pattern is pretty similar to the early phases of Shah Ismail's uprising before Tabriz. The army is very cautious. Most of the work is done by spies and informants. Uh, battle is avoided at all costs. Uh, the only military activity and preparation involves a large hunting expedition. Um, besides the changing sermon, there is no overt ideological or religious reform. Um, revelry and expenditure of money uh, by the soldiers is promoted, benefits the local economy, and there is some kind of justice that we are not told what it was. And uh, the timing, though, is really good because at this point there is no major adversary. The Ottomans are not coming, the Timorids are too busy, and the Aqbayuni have fallen apart, so nobody comes to lay siege to the town. Um, but it leaves enough time for the Aqbayunlu to kind of regroup somewhere else. And we, we are told that over 70,000 soldiers uh, and they're identified as Turkmen infantry and horsemen, had rallied around Sultan Murad Aqbuyunlu, who's another one of the uh, princes. Uh, and they're all gathering the southern parts of the old kingdom. And this is called Fars and Iraq Ajam, which is the, technically the Persian Iraq, although Ajam is not as ethnic as uh, the word Persian is. Anyhow, deciding that it would be wiser to attack Murad first, uh, their army starts to head south. Now, they're not called the Safavid army or the Sufis, they're called the Ghazi army. Ghazi means a kind of a holy warrior army. Um, and so they mobilize and they head south and they first go to Hamadan, uh, where they can get more information about the enemy. The problem is they have no idea of what this area is like and they run out of water real fast. Uh, so it takes them a while and they suffer from thirst and then eventually they dig wells and they get some water. Um, and this is then the author connects these to the hydraulic miracles of Noah and Moses uh, using the Quran. So uh, again, it kind of tells you they have no idea where they're going and they don't quite understand the landscape at all. So once they're refreshed, they uh, set out and they encounter the, uh, the enemy. Uh, the author makes a lot of the sort of better numbers and equipment of the adversary. He says they're, they were made up of horsemen from Fars, uh, spearmen from Iraq Arab, 
of the Arab Iraq, and archers from Western Iran, Iraq Ajam, all in armor, and uh, lots of camels carrying their weapons. And it says, but even though they were bigger, they quickly switched to a defensive strategy, and they built a barrier around themselves using carts and mud walls, uh, mud and straw. Uh, this is what the Ottomans use usually in battle, but the Ottomans have cannons. The Ottomans, I don't know why they do this. Uh, anyhow, they exhaust themselves by working all night on a construction project. And so the next day when they wake up, they're tired, and the Safavid army knows this. So they uh, charge their fortification. And uh, Ismail actually himself, we're told he prayed, he put on his crown, mounted his horse, and rode out as well. Um, but he hasn't, doesn't actually fight. It's a kind of a symbolic presence on the field. And again, it's the old veterans that manage most of the campaign. He's 14 now. So again, you've got these 30, 40-year-old guys who've been around with uh, Haydad and the Caucasus. They know what they're doing. So they kind of manage what, what happens. He just kind of stands there and watches. And what he does is kind of inspiration. And so this is how Amini describes it. He gives speeches to uh, the soldiers, and it, it draws on the rhetoric of holy war. So he says, you know, he uses the Quranic verses, or Amini uses the Quranic verse 4130. Uh, Charles last night was saying that when we write papers and history is full of jargon, we should write like our medieval contemporaries, or medieval uh, colleagues wrote. So I'll try some of these, see how it goes. If you like it, we'll, we'll write more like this. Uh, Lo, those who say our Lord is God and afterward are upright, the angels descend upon them, saying, fear not, nor grieve, but hear good tidings of the paradise which you are promised. Apparently Ismail is saying that. And 865, O prophet, exhort the believers to fight. If there be any of you 20 steadfast, they shall overcome 200. And that if there be any of you 100 steadfast, they shall overcome 1,000 of those who disbelieve. Because they, the disbelievers, are a people without intelligence. Later on in the heat of the battle, Ismail is inspired by 2250. Oh, Bahara 250. And when they went into the field against Goliath and his host, they said, Our Lord, bestow upon us endurance. Make our foothold sure and give us help against the disbelieving foe, Kafirin. How was that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so it works. Um, so uh, the choice of the verses is crucial. Uh, the inspiration is holy war by the friends of God against pagans, uh, like the Battle of Uhud and things like that. But the references are not apocalyptic. We are used to thinking of Shah Ismail's uprising as this kind of attempt to bring the apocalypse and so on. Uh, it's, it's not mentioned here, uh, but there's a lot of novelty here. Because in the 15th century, if you're familiar with the Timurid or Aqbuyunlu sources, the rhetoric of holy war is not usually used inside the Islamic lands. Um, Persian chronicles dealing with uh, the wars amongst the Timurids, Qaraquyunlu, uh, Aqbuyunlu, uh, don't do this. The, the places where you find a lot of holy war rhetoric and Quranic references like this are used are in the frontier regions of the Islamic world, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, in India, and so on. So it's not a surprise that the leadership, Ismail here, of the army named the Ghazi army, the holy warrior uh, army, whose soldiers were actually recruited primarily from the frontier regions of the Caucasus or the former Ottoman territories, would, that the leadership would evoke for these men the same rhetoric that had inspired the soldiers in their earlier careers, or perhaps their elders. So appeal to what we might call sectarianism is used here in the absence of a clearly identifiable religious other, Christians. In other words, Shiism, in whatever form was understood here, was not merely cause of Ismail's uprising, but the logic of its continuation as it helped create sharp binaries for soldiers who were accustomed to motivation through a pretty piercing dualism in the frontiers of Christendom. Okay, in other words, you take the daughter of Islam and you treat it like it's not by using sectarianism. The actual fighting, uh, you know, he says, and then we get into the fight, the Javanon on horseback with spears and daggers and so on. Uh, they, they attack, and then the Ghazis are shooting arrows into the Aqwinlu camp. Um, they initially come back. The Aqwinlu come out, and they push the Safavids back a little bit, but the Safavids push back again. Uh, there's a lot of charges and counter charges. And uh, basically, as they get chased, the Aqwinlu get over their own mud walls and carts and reach their own center and disrupt it. This happens twice in the early career of Shah Ismail. It's not what they're doing. It's what the enemy does to itself that causes them to win. Um, and so it's only at this point where it's clear that they're going to lose that Shah Ismail himself enters uh, battle, Jangis Sultani. 
um, and they charge en masse, and, they're all, and they shout, Allah, Allah, and they attack. And uh, in accordance to the theme of holy war, again, Amini talks about passages from David and Goliath and the Prophet Muhammad's battle of Uhud. And so they defeat them, and they kill many of them. And uh, the message is pretty clear that this is uh, Gaza, a holy war, but it's not against Christians. It's inside the domain of Islam. Um, now, I think it's seems... It seems pretty clear to me that they're actually not planning on even conquering the actual Aquilunlu territory. But it kind of opens it up. Once Prince Murad is defeated, the western part of the Iranian plateau is open. Um, and there's a lot of uh, plunder. They divide that among the Ghazis. They send out victory proclamation. Uh, and then they wait out the hot season in the meadow of uh, the mountains of Alvand near Hamadan. And then when summer ends, they hear that uh, Murad has escaped to Shiraz in the south. And these scattered Aqwayunlu soldiers have gone east towards Rey, today's Tehran. Uh, and they've regrouped under the banner of a local king called Hossein Kia. Uh, when he hears this, uh, the, one of the veteran commanders, El Yasbek, uh, is sent to deal with Hassan Kia. And then Esmail himself starts to head south. Uh, they have to secure their rear before they go deal with the other enemy. And uh, so they, you know, they go um, from Hamadan to Esfahan for a little bit. Then they go to Fars. Uh, when they get there, uh, Murad escapes and goes to Shushtar in Khuzestan. And so they don't follow him. They just go into Shiraz unopposed because now they have three cities, Hamadan, Esfahan, and Shiraz. Uh, again, it seems in the narrative at this point, they saw the entry into Shiraz as the completion of the initial or the second campaign. Um, now who's basically the Esmail is a contested master of much of the uh, former Aqayunlu territories. And um, the way the Safavid army behaves in Shiraz shows essentially caution or satisfaction. It's, they want to stop. Uh, and are, we are told that they didn't want to want to go into Khuzestan because they were afraid that he would uh, draw them out further into what is today Iraq, and they didn't want to go that far. So, um, so they go back to Shiraz, and uh, they stay there, and then they decide to kind of go and consolidate by visiting Qom and Kaushan as well. Um, again, looking at how Amini describes the stay in Shiraz and these uh, battles, you know, we're using the rhetoric of monotheism again, monotheist of monotheist versus polytheist, as I mentioned above. Uh, when they talk about the taking of the city, certain allusions to the apocalypse, are, you know, Judgment Day, are made, but to show the destruction. Uh, when it uses the uh, passage from the Quran, the earthquake of the hour of doom is a tremendous thing, etc. And then, well, so you got battle, right? Holy war, a kind of apocalyptic scene of defeat, followed by paradise, uh, wine, music, sexual pleasures that recall heaven. Uh, and uh, for example, the uh, Verses on like huris in heaven. This is the fair ones, hur, close, uh, closely guarded in pavilions. Or therein are those of modest gaze, whom neither, who, neither man nor genie will have touched before them. Okay, then from, from Kashan, they go, uh, from Shiraz, they go north to Kashan again. Uh, uh, verses referring to the Garden of Eden in the Quran. Praise be to God who has put away grief from us, or a fair land and an indulgent Lord. So essentially, right, you can kind of see a narrative progression. Holy war, turbulence, turbulence, heaven. He might, I mean, he might have put these uh, verses in the text, but I, I think it also reflects the expectations of his followers. If Sha, we know that Shah Ismail's poetry often evokes uh, the, the uh, possibility of the apocalypse, what have you. People kind of see this as he thinks, he thinks the end of time is coming. He, he might have thought that, but the soldiers, when they, if they are going to be at the end of time, they want to go to heaven, and heaven's right now in Tabriz, in Shiraz, where there's a lot of wine and sex and uh, money to be spent, right? So again, it could have stopped here, but new circumstances uh, pushed them to the, further to the east. Because remember that I said that Elias Beg had been sent to deal with this Hossein Kia? Well, Hossein Kia uh, gets the better of him uh, in uh, 1504. He pushes him. Uh, he basically defeats him. Elias Beg goes into the, to Baramin, fortifies himself, and uh, Elias Beg tricks him. And I'm sorry, uh, Hossein Kia tricks Elias Beg, brings him out, and murders him. And so Shah Ismail has to go and avenge this uh, action. 
Um, and here, the, the, the level of violence really picks up. Um, so they, you know, he heads east, Shah Ismail does. Uh, first, they go to this place called Golkhandan, which is uh, sort of central Iran, um, which was loyal to Hossein Kiyar. They don't open the gates. So the uh, Tsafav in mine, they dig tunnels under the wall, put some gunpowder and, gun and blow it up. Then they go inside, and the order is given by Ismail to massacre all the men and to enslave all the women and the children in order to show, quote, audacity and insolence against this crew, Ferge, only results in damage and loss. Uh, and again, he, I mean, he makes reference to the Quranic chapter of the earthquake to talk about this. Then they go east, 90 kilometers, to Firuz Ku. And uh, Hossein Kiyo has escaped there too. He's left his relative, I think it's his brother, uh, Ali Kiyo, in charge of the fort. The uh, siege here lasts 10 days. Then the fort submits. Again, the men are massacred. Women and children are enslaved. Uh, although Ali Kiyo is rewarded for his bravery. He's given a crown and a rope. And then the final infamous battle uh, takes place at the fort of Ustai. Um, and uh, apparently, it's possible that one of the Akkuyunlu has actually joined him there, uh, joined, has joined him there. And he talks about, in order to set us up, he talks about how terrible a person Hossein Kiyo was. And he says, that to, to show his terribleness, he talks about his uh, wastefulness. It says, his men possess 1,500 silver saddles and 500 gold saddles. What was worse, he took his many women on hunts with him, and whatever hound belonging to each of his wives brought back the kill first, Hossein Kiyo would honor that particular wife with the pleasure of his company that night. Now, all of this is, is meant to, the author is trying to make us you know, feel revulsion toward Hossein Kiyo because of what's coming. Um, it's a difficult battle. Uh, in the process, we were told that a brother of Ismail we've never heard of called Khaja Sayyid Mahmoud is killed in the battle. Um, and this really enrages the Shah. So when they take over again, uh, massacre everybody uh, after three days of uh, battle. And then Hossein Kiyo is taken and put on a cage and displayed to everybody. The cage is lifted up so everybody can see him. Now, this is a... Um, particular passage that people like to talk about because one, no, two Safavid sources later on say that Shah Ismail then cooked Hossein Kiyo, roasted him, and had his soldier eat, soldiers eat him, cannibalism, um, and distributed, then they distributed the prophet. Now, uh, Amini does not say this, okay? It doesn't talk about animalism, cannibalism. In the 20th century, early 20th century, uh, some Turkish nationalist uh, historians that dealt with this, but as well as some right-wing German scholars and Swedish scholars, Nazis or fascists like Franz Bobinger or uh, Stig Wickander, uh, they saw this as a sort of survival of some kind of an ecstatic pagan cult uh, into the Islamic period under the Safavid followers. Uh, Shahzad Bashir has recently uh, uh, written an article that debunked these arguments um, that there is no this is not a sign of a kind of ecstatic religious cult or anything like that. There's no other evidence for it. Uh, he tries to tie it to Sufi discipline, but I think even that is questionable because, again, only one source uh, ties this to religion. Everybody else just says that he was trying to make an exemplary punishment here. And, by the way, the idea of putting somebody in the cage as punishment was done by the Timurids. By Yazid I is put in the cage, and it happens once when they take over Isfahan. Uh, five minutes, yeah. All right. So... Um, it's only at this point that he's conquered the eastern part of the Aqoyunlu that they uh, run into the Timurids. And here the word Iran is used. Uh, because the, one of the, uh, Sultan Hussein Baikara sends an uh, envoy to him. Uh, but uh, Sir Ismail feels like the envoy didn't treat him as an equal. So he begins to think about maybe attacking uh, the Timurid territory. And he says, this, he realized that the scope of kingdom conquering, Keshwar Satani, is not limited to the two Iraqs and Azerbaijan, but rather can extend to Iran and Turan. So it's used as a kind of a geographical term, meaning Khorasan and Transoxania. And soon after this, an, an envoy arrives from the Ottoman Empire, and uh, he is shown uh, generosity. But then this is the scene where Amini says, and they took uh, Hossein Kiyar, they kill him, and they set his body on fire in front of the Ottoman envoy to really scare him. Um, and here the word Iran is used because he says, one, then he goes to Isfahan and gives people money, and it says, the houses that had been ruined, Viran, were revived by the army of Iran. So he's kind of rhyming it, but it doesn't seem to be a big role here. All right, conclusion. Um, 
So I, like I said, based on the most direct evidence, the followers of Shah Ismail and even apparently contemporary chronicles did not view the conquered territories of the Aquyunlu as Iran. In fact, they seemed to see territory as basically property. And if they sublimated and mythologized territory, it was to see it as paradise on earth, filled with pleasures of heaven. Um, that means that their notion of a political identity, which is today projected onto an immortal land, Iran, Germany, Italy, whatever, was actually projected onto something else in the 16th century. Uh, how was the body politic conceived? Uh, it comes to be conceived as the body of the king. And let's see if I can get to my PowerPoint here. How do I get out of this king? Escape. There we go. And that. We don't need the first one, obviously. Sludge. So that's how we see side of a territory today, right? <clears throat> now, we, when I said the body of the king, right? And this, if you read the work, uh, you might have heard of this through the work of Ernst Kantorowicz, who in 1957 wrote The King's Two Bodies. And he had this idea that the notion of the mystical uh, quality of the nation state, that is the political community that was inviolable, sovereign, and external, uh, and eternal was essentially derived from a similar function in the early modern period embodied in the king who was supposed to have an actual body that came to power and died and a mystical body that would not die. And this in turn was derived from medieval Christian theology that had come up with the two bodies of Christ, uh, corpus naturale, which is the natural body of Jesus, and the corpus mysticum, the social body of the church, which is a metaphorical body. <clears throat> Now, in our field, scholars have been kind of eager to indicate uh, similar phenomenon in the Middle East and South Asia. Um, but I feel like some of these have been rather content to just cut and paste Kantorowicz without working out the detail, uh, usually as a kind of an ahistorical phenomenon. Uh, and we don't see in these works how Kantorowicz actually develops change over time in his work. Um, and it doesn't make sense why something derived from Christian theology should have a meaning in the Middle East or in the Islamic world, anyway. Um, so I think um, I can't deal with all this here, but I would like to show you a few instances of the body of the king actually being used in a symbolic way in Safavid era productions. Well, what we call a country today would be defined as a kingdom, Keshvar or Molk. But these terms were used metaphorically, especially in the 16th century. For example, Amir Mahmoud ibn Khan Damir, who writes in 1550, uh, at some point expresses his hope that the appointment of Shah Tahmas with the governorship, governorship of Khorasan was meant to, quote, heal the wounds that had been inflicted on the body of the kingdom, Badane Molk, by the blade and assault of rebels. He describes the entry of Ibrahim Sultan into Harat in, the, in these words. He says, the Sultan in the land, uh, Balad, is like the soul in the corpse, Jasad. Uh, a few decades later, the philosopher Sheikh Bahai writes, quote, kingship for the subjects is like the soul for the corpse and the head for the body. Uh, the metaphor is sometimes reversed, describing the execution of the Kurdish ruler, Khosrow Beg, Sharafuddin Bitlisi writes in the late 16th century, uh, the Sultan exiled his sacred spirit from the kingdom of his body, keshvar e uh, Earlier, Idris Bitlisi had written in the Qanun Shahan Shahi, that in the kingdom of human existence, Mamlekate, Wujude, and Sani, the spirit has the rank of leadership and kingship. So I'm not suggesting that you know, the Safavids are inventing this metaphor. Uh, it was certainly older. There are echoes of this in Behagi or Al Ghazali. Rather, what I want to show is that in the 16th century, they certainly conceived of the kingdom as a body with the king as its head. And since the kingdom was made up of a number of smaller tri tributary kingdoms, right? You're, if you're the king of kings, Shah Shah, you're the king of other kings, um, as the Safavid state was, then the, this body itself was made of a number of other smaller bodies, other kingdoms, right? With the king at its head. And this image might remind you, or reminded me anyway, of the front piece of uh, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, where uh, the king is up here, and that's the body, and the body is filled with other people. And, uh, this is the original drawing for it. The heads are all there. Uh, this is done by a uh, French Huguenot painter, Abraham uh, Boss, uh, and uh, in the 17th century. Uh, and Hobbes was in Holland and then went to France for this. 
Now, I don't know of a Safavid version, but I think there's a similar ex idea that existed um, elsewhere because the, uh, another 17th century, this time a Dutch painter, uh, Willem Schellings has this picture done for the Mughal Empire. Where you, can you see that? Where you see, um, this is supposed to be Shah Jahan and his sons. But the, the thing they write on is made up of these people, right? It's a composite animal, pretty common in the Islamic art. But uh, this might be a kind of an Orientalist exoticizing because it's filled with like women dancing and what have you. Uh, but the actual, the actual idea does exist in Mughal paintings. And here, I think, we can kind of see that where, uh, so in Mughal India, following old Indian um, custom, kingdom is the king on his elephant. The king, kingdom is the elephant, and the king is the elephant driver. So you, you see the kingdom conceived as bodies inside the elephant, both human and animal. And the king himself is made up of other bodies. So I think this is probably how the subjects of the Safavids view the Safavid kingdom or kingship, uh, and not this. The bird's eye view, fetishized, cut out of Iran that we now associate with an inviolable sovereignty. Thank you. My paper is about periodization. Where do we draw the boundaries between periods? It is traditional in Iranian historiography to divide the timeline according to dynasty. We speak of the Achaemenid period and the Abbasid period, the Ilkhanate and the Timurids as the primary building blocks of the Iranian story. It is a useful way of structuring Iranian history, especially since the surviving source material tends to emphasize political events. But dividing the timeline in this way can obscure as well as reveal. It may give the impression that all changes, even all political changes, are concentrated at the beginnings and endings of dynasties, which of course is not true. And so it is with the Safavids. We are accustomed to thinking of the Safavids as a unique period in Iranian history, distinct from what came before and setting the stage for what would come after. They get credit for making several long-lasting changes to Iran. They established Shiism as the predominant religion. They reestablished, at least it's said, a Persian dynasty after centuries of non-Persian rule. They are credited with establishing the modern boundaries of Iran. They ruled Iran during its first extensive contact with the West. Some of the traits attributed to the Safavids are probably unwarranted. Regarding the establishing of the boundaries of Iran, really only the Western boundary was solidified in the Safavid era. The Northern and Eastern boundaries were still fluid through the Qajar period. Defining the Safavids as a Persian dynasty is problematic because it presumes national identities that are more relevant to the modern world than to the period of the Safavids, as Ali has just talked about. Contacts with the West increased gradually over many centuries, beginning well before the Safavid period began and accelerating well after. With regard to the conversion of Iran to Shiism, that definitely happened during the Safavid period, but we know very little about the process. In fact, we probably will never know much about the process. There is just too little source material to go on. We do know that Ismail was not exactly a conventional 12 or Shi, and it stands to reason, based on the evidence we have, that Sunni Islam maintained a presence in, Iranian, in the Iranian population for several decades at least after 1501. But we just do not know enough to venture a timeline for the process of conversion. So I will set that aspect of the Safavids aside for this paper. But if we consider the conventional picture of the Safavid era, I would venture that what comes to mind is a certain urbane refinement after centuries of rule by nomadic pastoralists. We picture the elegant architecture, the literary and intellectual discussions. The Safavids are considered, often portrayed, as the revival of Persian culture, setting the stage for the emergence of modern Iran. I would argue that what is implied by that depiction of the Safavids is that they restored an urban-based Iran. Modern Iran is urbanized. The classical Persian civilization is conceptualized as urban. And in that light, the period in the Middle Ages 
when Iran was dominated by nomadic tribes, might seem backward by comparison. So the Safavids, with their cities and their urban culture, might seem like a return to civility. I personally do not share the moral judgment of urban being superior to nomadic, but I do think there is something qualitatively different about the Safavids as compared with the preceding dynasties. And that difference is in the place the city held in Safavid culture. Now that said, when scholars talk about the Safavid period, they typically define the period as the years of the dynasty as a whole, from 1501 to 1722 or otherwise from 1501 to 1736, depending on how one defines the end of the dynasty. But treating the Safavid period as a block can lead to some misunderstandings about when these changes came about. Very little about Iran changed in 1501 or in the immediately following years. The traits we normally attribute to the Safavids emerged only much later. So I think it would be helpful for us to use a threefold division of the Safavid dynasty with the periods named after the three nominal capitals. The Tabriz period, encompassing the first half of the 16th century, the Ghazvin period, the second half, and the Esfahan period, which in would include all of the 17th century down to the siege of 1722. Each of these periods has a unique character that makes it distinct from the others and we only begin to see the emergence of a new distinct Safavid Iran during the middle period the Ghazvin period. I hasten to add that I use this terminology loosely. The very idea that Safavid Iran had a capital city is one of those characteristics of the Safavids that we take for granted, but that did not exist during the reign of Ismail I. I have discussed this matter in more detail elsewhere. Just briefly, I will note that Tabriz did not function as the permanent residence of the Shah, and its status as capital was an honorific one. In fact, this is one reason for treating the first half of the 1500s as distinct from the rest of Safavid history. I will return to this point in a moment, but first I want to address why we should not consider 1501 a special year in Iranian history. That 1501 was not a major watershed moment is of course true on the simplest political level, Esmail's enthronement in Tabriz did not bring the Akunyulu to an immediate end. The Safavid wars of conquest continued for several more years. It was only in 1508 that the last regions of Akunyulu power finally fell to Esmail with his conquests of Diyarbakir and Baghdad. In fact, Esmail's new reign was, in a way, a continuation of the Akunyulu, since Esmail himself was a grandson of Uzun Hasan, the most famous of the Akunyulu rulers. And the Akunyulu leaders he defeated, Alvand and Murat, for example, were his cousins. Esmail's reign was a continuation of the Akunyulu in another way also. Esmail's regime was structurally very similar to that of the Akunyulu and of other Turkic polities that had ruled in one part or another of Iran for centuries. These polities were based on the military power of the Turkic nomadic pastoralists who had come to dominate Iran from the time of the Mongols. And the new Safavi regime was likewise based on the military power of Turkic nomadic pastoralists. Even within the Safavi movement, this military power had begun decades before Esmail captured Tabriz in 1501. Another grandfather of Esmail, aside from Uzun Hasan, was Sheikh Junaid, the leader of the Safavi Sufi order who had militarized the Safaviye in the middle of the 15th century. He gathered a following of Turkic pastoralist tribes living in Anatolia who became his devoted disciples. These tribes, known as the Bezelbosh for the red headgear they wore, formed the core of the newly reinvented Safavi movement. They had stayed loyal to the Safavi Sufi line at the end of the 15th century as the leaders of the order came under Al-Qoyunlu persecution and went into hiding. The Bezelbosh were Ismail's army when he emerged from hiding and when he launched his campaign to conquer the territory of the Akunyulu. And afterward, Esmail granted the conquered lands to the Ghazalbash tribes in the same way that the rulers of the previous Turco-Mongolian polities had done. Of course, Esmail did have the habit of appointing his sons as provincial governors, 
but these were only nominal appointments. His sons were young children. And in practice, these were land grants to Gizelbosch tribes, with Gizelbosch emirs serving as the real commanders of the provinces. So Ismail's new regime was, in fact, very much like the tribal confederations that had ruled Iran for centuries. The only difference was that now, the family in power was a line of Sufi peers. This difference had consequences for how succession in the Safavid dynasty would be handled. But there was no practical difference between how Akunyulu leaders, or Karakunyulu, or Timurid leaders for that matter, governed their tribal confederations, and how Shah Ismail I governed the Safavid state. Nor was there a practical difference in how these polities were structured. Not only was the new Safavi regime similar to the Akunyulu in being dominated by nomadic tribes, they even included some of the same tribes. Both the Musilu and the Qajar had been part of the Akunyulu confederation before becoming Kezelbosh. It is, after all, no accident that Ismail proclaimed his new reign in Tabriz. Tabriz had been the capital city of the Akunyulu, established as such in the 1470s by Ismail's grandfather, Uzun Hassan. But Ismail spent much of his reign away from Tabriz, which brings me to another point about what I call the Tabriz period. Shah Ismail I lived the lifestyle of a nomadic pastoralist. Pastoralists must move from one pasture to another during the year to provide for their herds. Commonly in Iran, they will move from lower elevations in the winter to higher elevations in the summer and then back again. In the period after the Mongol conquests, we see many examples of rulers of Iran moving regularly from one place to another, rather than being settled in a capital city. And when they did visit a city, they often camped in a garden outside the city, rather than staying in a palace in the city center. Esmail continued this tradition by staying in a tent and participating in the seasonal migrations. Every spring, he set out with his court and with herds of sheep to spend the summer in a high altitude pasture. The sources report a variety of locations, usually around Iranian Azerbaijan. <coughs> Sahand, a high volcano outside of Tabriz, was a favorite of his, but he also summered farther away in Sultanie or Tahte de Suleiman. Winters were often spent in Tabriz, but he also spent winters elsewhere. He was sometimes absent from Tabriz because he was on a military campaign, but he maintained the nomadic lifestyle even when not on campaign. Even during the last decade of Ismail's reign, following his disastrous defeat at Chaldaran in 1514, that according to the Safavid historians left him dejected and uninterested in campaigning, even then he still spent much of his time moving about the country, spending two winters in Nakhchivan and one in Esfahan. So his habit of moving about the country was not always due to military necessity. It was simply the normal way of life for him. He was fully adapted to the Turkic nomadic lifestyle. In this regard, as in others, Ismail presents a striking contrast to the habits of the Safavid Shahs during the last century of the dynasty, who spent their whole lives in the palace at Esfahan. While Ismail partook of the lifestyle of the rural nomadic Turks, the late Safavid Shahs were adapted to the genteel lifestyle of the urban Tajiks. Esmail died in 1524. In the preceding Turco-Mongolian regime, such as the Timurids and the Akunulu, <clears throat> wars of succession were common, in which the tribes divided into factions supporting different sons or other male relatives of the recently deceased leader. Significantly, the Safavid succession in 1524 did not follow that pattern. Esmail had four sons, who by Turco-Mongolian reckoning would each have been equally qualified to succeed Esmail. But the oldest son, Tahmasp, took the throne without incident or challenge. This is undoubtedly due to the Sufi character of the Safavi Qizilbash movement, in that one normally became the leader of a Sufi order by being designated to that office by the preceding sheikh. And that is, in fact, what happened in 1524. Ismail designated Tahmasp his successor, 
both as ruler of the Safavid territories and as peer of the Safavi Sufi order. Otherwise, court culture during the early reign of Tahmasp continued as it had been under Ismail I. Just as Ismail had usually taken part in the seasonal migrations, so did Tahmasp. This pattern is obscured during the first dozen or so years of Tahmasp's reign by the near constant series of crises presented by invading Uzbeks, invading Ottomans, and the occasional internal rebellion. When that settled down in the 1530s, Tahmasp spent most of his summers in summer pastures at various locations, usually around Azerbaijan. He mainly spent his winters in one of two cities, either Tabriz or Qazvin. He spent more and more time in Qazvin as he got older, until he finally settled there permanently in 1558. This is not a matter of the Shah moving the capital from Tabriz to Qazvin. Rather, the Shah was transitioning from a nomadic lifestyle to a sedentary one. From 1558 until his death in 1576, Tahmasp spent every summer and every winter in Qazvin. Here, finally, we see the sedentary habit so familiar in the late Safavid Shahs, who stayed in Esfahan year-round. With the settling of the Shah in Ghazvin, a new urban-based Safavid culture began to emerge. The cities of Safavid Iran already had an urban culture, of course, but now for the first time, that urban culture became integrated with the court. The close association between the court and the arts, both literary and visual, that we associate with the late Safavid period had its roots here in Ghazvin. This morning I will discuss just one aspect of this, of a particularly Safavid historiographical tradition. History writing under the Safavids obviously took place before that. But there is a difference between history writing in the first half of the 16th century and history writing in the second half. There is a unity to history writing in the latter part of the century that did not exist early on. We have several historical works from Safavid Iran during the first half of the century, from the Tabriz period. We just heard about the Futuhati Shahi in, uh, from Ali Yanushar. Suffice it to say for now that the Futuhati Shahi is almost entirely focused on the reign and exploits of Shah Ismail, down to the year 1513. The early chapters recount events before Ismail's birth, but as a prelude in preparation for Ismail's coming. Khandamir's Habib Asiyar is a universal history divided into three volumes, or Mujallad. The first volume covers the ancient world up to and including the time of Muhammad and the first four caliphs. The second volume surveys the history of the world from the rise of Islam to the coming of Genghis Khan. And volume three covers the period of the Mongol rule up through the rise of the Safavids. This organizational scheme recalls the words of the Ilkhanid historian Rashid Adin when he wrote, what event or occurrence has been more notable than the beginning of the government of Genghis Khan, that it should be considered a new era. Khandamir structured his world history around two big historical watersheds, the career of Muhammad and the career of Genghis Khan. Another chronicle was written in the early part of Tahmasp's reign Mir Yahya ibn Abd al-Latif al-Husseini al-Ghazvini wrote the Lubb Tavarikh in 1542 under the patronage of Bahram Mirza, the younger brother of Shah Tahmasp. Uh, Ghazvini, the author, uh, was later accused of being the leader of the Ghazvin Sunnis and was imprisoned where he died in 1555. The Lubb Tavarikh is divided into four unequal parts. Part one covers the life of the Prophet Muhammad and his family. Parts two and three cover secular history, both before and after Muhammad, respectively. And part four, which is very short, summarizes the history of the Safavids. Part three, covering the history of the world from the time of Muhammad to the rise of Shah Ismail, is by far the longest part of the chronicle, encompassing more than two thirds of the text. The part dedicated to the Safavids, by contrast, is just a brief few pages. These chronicles, Futuhati Shahi, Habib Siyar, Lubutavarikh, are quite different from each other 
in what they emphasize and in how they structure Iranian history. And that is the point. At this stage, there was no historiographical discourse particular to the Safavid era. Khan Demir wrote a history of the world, essentially in the Timurid style. It could very easily have been a Timurid history, with the events of Shah Ismail's reign tacked on at the end. The futuhat e shahi is essentially a panegyrical biography. And then there is the lubb tavarikh an interesting text, which is supposed to be a history of the world up to the present, which at the time was 1542, but whose author seems to be half in denial that the Safavid period had even happened. Now contrast this with historical writing in the Ghazvin period. As I said, Ghazvin became Tahmasp's permanent capital in 1558. Not that 1558 is in itself significant for historical writing, but it gives us a convenient boundary date. Four more histories were written in Ghazvin uh, after 1558, either during Tahmas reign or, sent, or immediately after. The first of these was written by Ghazi Ahmad Ghafari Ghazvini, the author of the Nusikh e Jahan Ra. Ghafari spent his career in Ghazvin, which by that time had become Tahmasp's capital, and worked for the Shah's brother, Sam Mirza. Later, after Tahmasp had Sam arrested, Ghaffari moved to India where he wrote his summary of world history. The book recounts the lives of Muhammad and the Imams, reviews the dynasties of world history, and then devotes considerable space to a year-by-year -year chronicle of the history of the Safavid period up to 1565. Another historian closely associated with court culture in Ghazvin was Abdi Beg Shirazi, who wrote the Takmilat al-Akhbar, Abdi Beg worked in the Daftar Khane, or Chancellery, in Tahmasp's administration. The Takmilat al Akbar was another universal history, of which only the last part covering the Safavid period has been published. It reports the reigns of both Ismail and Tahmasp up to the year 1570. Then there are the two historians writing right after Tahmasp died. Budak Munshi Ghazvini wrote the Jawahar al Akbar at the behest of Shah Ismail II in 1577. This was again a history of the world with a substantial section devoted to the Safavid dynasty. And the famous Ahsana Tavarikh by Hassan Rumlu, well known to English speaking scholars because it is one of only two Safavid chronicles translated into English. It is also supposed to have been a universal history. Oh, three, now that I think of it, three. Safavid Chronicles. It is also supposed to have been a universal history, but only the last two volumes survive, covering the end of the Akunulu and the entire length of the Safavid history through the year 1577. Both Budok Munshi Ghazvini and Hassan Rumlu relied in part on their own personal experiences serving in the royal court. It has already been noted by Shole Quinn and Charles Melville that the, quote, real flourishing of Safavid historiography began during the reign of Shah Tahmasp. I would go a step further and say the real flourishing began during the Ghazvin period, after Ghazvin became the permanent capital. The historians of Ghazvin were all engaged in a common project to tell the history of the Safavid dynasty. In all cases, that was an essential aspect of their text. So I will close with this thought. We can see in the Ghazvin historians a new tendency toward conceptualizing themselves as Safavid, as living in a Safavid period of Iranian history, distinct from previous periods, and of embracing that as their identity, or at least part of their identity. We do not see this reflected in the historians of the early 16th century. This is, so far as our sources indicate, a new sensibility, which happens to coincide with this new urban-oriented phase of Safavid rulership. And this Safavid sensibility continued in Iran in the early 17th century with the flourishing of dynastic histories, in the late 17th century with the fashion for quasi-historical romances, through to the end of the Safavid period. Thank you. This paper is part of a, a larger project on Turkic literature and uh, ideologies of language uh, in the medieval and early modern Persian world in general and Safavid Iran in particular. Today I, was, I will discuss and contextualize 
a short polemical treatise entitled Hikayat e Yohanna, Tagzibu Mazamat in Munafiki, Munafikonu, Tazdiki Yakinahti Iman, the story of Yohanna, or the scorn and refutation of the hypocrites, and the verification <coughs> of the firm conviction of the people of belief. Written by an otherwise <coughs> little known Turkophone literateur by the name of Gharibi, who flourished sometime in the second and third quarters of the 16th century. On the one hand, the paper draws attention to the presence of learned polemical religious prose literature in Turkic produced in the Safavid context and sponsored by the Safavid elite. On the other hand, by trying to contextualize this short treatise, it will connect the disappearance of such genres in Turkic from the Safavid literary horizon with the changing political and religious environment around the turn of the 16th and the 17th centuries, which also had a profound impact uh, on <coughs> literary patronage. The Safavid period resulted in the religious and political separation of Ottoman Anatolia and Central Asia from Iran, leading in turn to their social and cultural and in a different way, also linguistic separation. One of the problems this paper therefore grapples with is the search for a place for such non-prestige literary idioms as Turkic in Iranian early modernity, an age when both religion and state as well as language and state, became more closely associated. Due to the compartmentalization of scholarship along modern nationalist lines, the study of Turkic literary culture in Iran has been <coughs> almost entirely neglected. Most scholars of Iran accepting the simplified account of vernacularization that Islamic Iran turned Persian <coughs> in the 9th and 10th centuries for literary purposes and end of story. At the same time, for nationalist Soviet and post-Soviet Azerbaijani scholarship, the Turkic, out, the Turkic output of the Safavid period is far more significant than Persian. So two parallel universes. <laughs> According to the Adoyan of Safavid history, Roger Savory, at the Safavid takeover, there was an acute shortage of Shiite bo books in Iran. While this statement still awaits uh, qualification and the numbers behind it are still yet to be specified, that does seem, to seem a fair leap in the production of Shiite religious learning in the latter half of the Safavid rule. An important development of this, as discussed by <coughs> scholars like Saeed Ajuman, uh, Rula Bissab, and Rasul Jafarian, was the translation of religious learning into Persian, rendering mo much of Shi Shiite pious literature accessible to the broader, to broader populace and greatly facilitating the actual conversion of Iranian society to Shi'ism. While it's possible to see religious works in Persian coming out of, of Safed Iran against the background of this popularization of Shi'ism, Turkic literary practices were taking place in a larger patrimonial context, depending on the on and off patronage of various Kizilbash emirs and remain, remaining at the level of popular culture. It is significant that Gharibi composed his work, The Story of Johanna, in Turkic. As is well known, for example, from Western, Western travel, travel accounts, not only were various Turkic dialects widely spoken in Safavid Iran, but also the court had a large number of Turkic speakers. As Wilhelm Flor and Hassan Javadi reminds, remind us, Esfahan, the capital city from, <coughs> from 15, uh, nine, around 1597, had a quarter by the name of Abbas Abad, where Turkic speakers from Tab Tabriz were settled. And the court, as well as the Safir dynasty, conversed in Turkic on a daily basis. Of course, Turkic had not only communicational or util utilitary, but also symbolic functions. Part of the cultural makeup of the Safids and the Turkmen Kuzilbash elite, Turkic poetry was practiced in the households of Kuzilbash notables and Safavid princes. This is attested by three biographical anthologies of poets, Samir Zaz uh, Tohfe Sami from, um, from sometime uh, around the middle of the 16th century, Sadiqi Beg's Majma Khavas, both of which dedicated a special section to Turkophone poets in the Safavid realm. While Samir Zaz composed his anthology in Persian, Sadiqi Beg wrote his in Chagatai Turkic in express reference to the Timurid literary tradition and its best known and most paradigmatic proponent, Mir Ali Shinovai, who died in 1501. 
And we should, not, we should also mention the third biographical dictionary of poets written by our own hero today, Garibi, under t the title Taskirat al-Shuara, which lists Turkophone poets in the land of Rum, whom the author characterizes in terms of conf confessional ambiguity as lovers of the house of Ali, Ali, and many of whom were associated with the Safavids. However, while there was a significant amount of poetry written in Turkic and Safavid around all through the tenure of the dynasty, and in fact, also afterwards, down to our very, very own days, the Azeri Turkic literary tradition constituting a robust literary continuum, the production, the production of learned prose in the Safavid period in Turkic is, was meager, quite in contrast with the plethora of historical, biographical, or religious works in Persian. It seems that in the period under discussion, literary prose was practiced in but a few genres in Turkic, and even in these genres, the number of such works was limited. Aside from poetry, there was also the tradition of legendary story cycles, most prominently about such messianic figures as Abu Muslim, expressive of the antinomian messianic spirit of the early Safavids and the Khazarbash, religiosity that was subject to persecution from the late 16th century on. We can assume, albeit there is little in scholarship about language practices in early modern Iran, that the scarcity of learned religious prose had to do with the social context uh, for Turkic. Theology is connected to a madrasa context, and by extension to an urban environment, and is alien to the nomadic tribal, tribal uh, milieu. Uh, uh, aristocratic orders, did that work? All right. <laughs> I don't know how to make that into an adjective. So, uh, uh, so it was alien uh, to the milieu of the Kuzilbash tribal follow, uh, following of the Safavids. As cities were <coughs> Persian-speaking, or largely Persian-speaking, literary production in Turkic in the higher genres of Islamic religious learning was at a low rate. This holds true even with the caveat that the field of Turkic literary culture in Iran is so much neglected in scholarship and so much of the pertinent source material is still lying in manuscripts that our knowledge is still in considerable flux. It seems that under the Safavids, most Turkic learned religious literature was intended for the adherence of the Safavid tariqa. We can adduce hagiographical works, such as several Turkic translations of the Safa to Safa, the, la the later several times modified official history of the Safavid order, which was originally written in Persian by Tavakul ibn Asma ibn Bazaz in 1358. One of the Turkic translations itself was made in 1542 in Shiraz by, by a certain Muhammad al Khatib Nashati under the patronage <coughs> of Shah Kulu uh, Khalifa of the Zulqadar Kuzilbash Oymak. And in uh, 1538, Nashati also translated under, under the title Shohada Name, Koshifi's Rosat al Shohada, an Alid Martyrology. This is not the only Turkic rendition of Koshifi's of Koshifi work. For Zulu's translation, entitled Hadikat al Suada, is much better known. Indeed, although Fuzuli is usually mentioned in, in the Ottoman context, the Persian and Turkish literary output, his uh, Persian and Turkish uh, literary output, had Safavid patrons too. We know of two figures from Ardabil who each composed a work in Turkic on the tenets of Tuwaiva Shiism. One was Kamaluddin Hussein Il Al Ilahi al Ardabili, died in uh, 1543, who was first a protege of Haider Safavi then studied with Jalaluddin Davoni, Amir Ghiasuddin al-Dashtaki, <coughs> and was also patronized by uh, Nevai and Prince Ghari Mirza ibn Sultan Hussein Baikara in Timurid Herat. After the death of his Timurid patron, he returned to Iraq and Azerbaijan, became an instructor in the Safavid order, and died in 1543. He was a prolific author with poetry, religious treatises, and commentaries in Persian and Arabic. But he also is also said to have written <clears throat> a treatise on the Imamit in Turkic and then translated it into Persian. Another prose work we know to have come from the ranks of religious scholars, 
from Ardabil, who joined the Safavids, is the Aqaid al-Islam written by <coughs> Uh, Ahmad ibn, uh, ibn uh, Muhaqqiq Ardabili, also known as uh, Al Muqaddas al Ardabili. An influential Shiite scholar from the latter half of the 16th century. From the 17th century, one could mention the Isbat Imamat by one Khodavadi Tabrizi, who was commissioned sometime between 14, uh, 1614 and uh, 1629 by Shah Abbas to give a concise summary of the basic tenets of Shism in an attempt at converting a Crimean prince as part of the Safavids' ongoing at anti-Ottoman war effort. <clears throat> we know few but significant details about Garibi's life all of which come from the manuscript of his complete works, bearing the title Divan Garibi, the unique copy of which, <coughs> executed in uh, 1590 by one Mukhtar ibn Mirza Zaki Maraghi, can be found at the Majlis Library in Tehran. This is uh, the first uh, page of the, uh, fo of, the, of the folio, first folio. Uh, <coughs> this misbound divan is one large composition and the constituent parts of which are loosely arranged, according to uh, <coughs> giving the narrative framework of the four season, eulogizing the reign of Tahmasp, and also including Shah Ismail I, whose poetry Gharibi imitates on multiple occasions in the form of Naziraz, parallel poems, and Muhammad's, <coughs> and Muhammad's which, which are kind of uh, five line uh, strophe extending uh, individual lines from a previous poetry. In a dissertation, Zainab Altok makes the case that the emphatic descriptions of, the, of gardens and palaces at the end of the volume are related to the construction of the palace complex Saadat Abad under Tahmas in his new capital, Kazvin. This would date Garibi's work between the early 1550s and Tahmas's death in uh, 1576. However, in his story about Johanna, Gharibi quotes a Shiite scholar, Mujtahid, Zainuddin uh, Ali, who is likely identical with, Ash with Ashrahid al Sani, who died in 1558, and whom Gharibi indicates to have already been dead. This d dates the whole work between 1558 and 1576, unless, of course, uh, the Rahmatullah after uh, Zainuddin's name is in the interpolation of the copies. In an autobiographical prose piece, Gharibi informs us that his late father was Haji Muslihuddin Amir Khan from the Khalifas, uh, <coughs> or agents, of Sheikh Safiuddin in the province of Mantasha in southwest Anatolia, <coughs> important elements uh, of which were prominent supporters of the Safavids. So they were coming from the Mantasha Confederation. According to Garibi's description, his father was a, was a Talib Haq, or Darish. He lived at a place called uh, Bozayuk, which was his hereditary seat. Uh, Garibi received an early introduction to the mystical path from his father, a training that was cut short by the latter's death when Garibi was 10, due to the persecution of the Qizilbash and Shiites during the reign of Selim I between 1512 and 1520. His father, was executed after a show trial conducted by Sunni ulama. After that, he joined the Safavid order a movement, becoming a meddah, an encomiast, a court, court poet, uh, to Shah Ismail. Uh, during these early years, he seems to be also affiliated with the Mavlavis through Shahidi Dada, Dede, the well-known lexicographer, and with the Halvatis and Gulshanis through Ibrahim Gulshani. Who hands, uh, whose ha hands he claims to have kissed when in 1528, uh, the latter, that is Ibrahim Gulshani, was brought to Sultan Suleiman's court in Istanbul. The star story Gharibi tells is simple, not untypical of religious polemics. A Jew from Egypt by the name of Johanna, having studied with Jewish and Greek, Greek scholars, the latter means philosophers, uh, converts to Islam. He studies the teachings of the four Sunni legal schools. And because of the contradictions between them, and because he finds certain things in Sunnism unsettling, he goes to Baghdad and interviews four religious scholars, Qadis, representing each of these four schools. 
In the process, the scholars contradict each other and also reveal anomalies in their legal approach. Only in one thing are they united, the condemnation of Shism. Predictably, Johanna becomes convinced of the superiority of 12 Shism and converts to it. Unfortunately, the volume, <coughs> that is the manuscript, has been misbound and some of the leaves are missing. Therefore, several of Garibi's works, including the Hekayata Johanna and the subject of today's paper, are defective. We only have roughly two contiguous chunks misbound and separated from each other. The story has other variants, too, in Arabic and Persian, the exact relationship among which is yet to be elaborated on in the future. These versions go under such titles as Al Zamun Nawasib, Resale Yohanna, or Menhaj Al Manahaj, attributed by the 18th century biographer Mirza Abdullah Effendi Esfahani to Abu Futuh al Razi, who died in 1157, a prominent Shiite scholar of the 12th century, better known for his Quran commentary, Rosul Jinan. An identification that has been subject to doubt. Uh, more recently. The Arabic and Persian versions can be found in over 40 manuscripts, mostly 19th century copies. The following scheme, uh, uh, the following schema or schema is a very rudimentary model for the mutual relationships between the individual versions based on just a handful of manuscripts and catalog and descriptions uh, and there's no critical edition or study of the paper trail relating. So uh, it, this is really kind of uh, the first step in establishing the, uh, the, story of the, the story of the story, as it were. A lot of further work is needed, and the schema is no more than a prelim preliminary hypothesis. But it will perhaps help us demonstrate a number of conclusions with regards to Garibi's Turkic version. I posit that the versions uh, go back to the same variety of the story of varieties close to each other. The dotted lines indicate hypothetical versions and hypothetical relationships. The earliest version I know of is actually Garibis, with a number of distinguishing features, a few of which I will, I will list in just a minute. The next versions date from the late 17th century. They are in Persian and go back to an unknown Arabic rendition, which is also related to later Arabic versions, one of which in turn was published, uh, published in Karbala down in the bottom in, in the 1960s. We also have another group of Persian manuscripts, one of which formed the basis for a lithog lithographic edition in uh, 1889. As far as Garibi is concerned, there are two basic conclusions this schema uh, suggests. One is that his, his was the earliest version, and another, another that it is separate from the other groups. Indeed, at this point, it seems that the work we, was retranslated in the late 17th century into Persian, and that new translation, <coughs> and that new translation was, born, uh, on a, was based on a diff very different model. Indeed, even from the truncated state of the work, as it has come down to the present, it is apparent that Garibi introduced new features, several of which were tailored to, Safavid, to the Safavid context. For example, at a certain point in the story, <coughs> a dervish by the name of Bouvafar joins Garibi and the four Sunni Qadis and points out some of the grievances of Shiites, such as the story related, related to the last military cam campaign led by Osama ibn Zaid during the time of the Prophet, and how Abu Bakr and Omar did <coughs> didn't want to participate in it. For they received word from uh, Aisha about the approaching death of Muhammad. Or the incident of the Orchard of Fadak, which Abu Bakr confiscated from Fatima, although it had been left to her by the Prophet. And Omar even tore up Muhammad's handwriting, proving her ownership. The dervish concludes in reciting a, concludes in reciting a lengthy tabarra, tabarra litany, cursing the companions, the first two caliphs, the Ottomans, etc. This is very interesting if we recall during the reign of Tahmasp, with the promotion and control of Shiite public piety, in, with, with the... With the <coughs> um, Sorry. 
So with the promotion and control of Shiite public piety in view, the tabara, or public cursing, was institutionalized in the form of a separate group funded by the treasury. The presence of a tabara text in Garibi might also be taken as indicative of the social and ritual context of such Turkic texts under the Safavids and the highly performative character. Similar to, for example, Kashifi's aforesaid Alid Martyrology, the Rosat of Shohada, or Shah Ismail's poetry, as illustrated by Garibi in his entry uh, on Shah Ismail in his biographical com compendium. A similarly messianic, proselytizing ethos and performative, public, possibly ecstatic oral context should be seen in the poem Garibi inserts as illustrative of Ali's bravery during the Battle of Uhud. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Made up of quatrains, the poem is a morabba and is the elaboration of a theme well known from popular Turkic poetry, the, the most famous rendition of which was written by the 14th century uh, Hurufi poet uh, Nesimi, a poet that was also misattributed to Shah Ismail I, as I have argued elsewhere. In another instance, Garibi tries to appeal to Safavid royal, or rather Sufi audience, by quoting the eponymous founder of the Safavid order, Safiur Dinada Bili. Quote, a sound report, Nakli uh, Sahih, <coughs> uh, taken from the noble majlis of Shay Safi Uddin, may God most high, most high perpetuate the guidance of his progeny over the heads of the two worlds. In it, Sheikh Safi reports that before his death, the Prophet left instructions that after his death, uh, <coughs> he be interred at night, lest uh, he be interred at night lest Abu Bakr should find out about it and participate in the ceremony. As I've already alluded to it, he also quotes a report from the prominent Shiite scholar Zainuddin Ali, the, uh, the, the Ash-Shahid al-Sani, on how Umar prevented Muhammad from registering Ali's succession in writing by not letting writing accessories be brought to him. Hasbun al-Kitabullah. So uh, the, 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 the Quran is enough for us. Various further subjects are discussed over which the four, over which the four Sunni Qadis intensely clash, such as the ritual of, uh, ritual of ablution, inheritance, uh, the legal status of children coming from illicit relationships, the Hanafi and Sh uh, Shafi use of chaos or an analogy, prayer rit rituals, purity regulations, some of which, particularly succession, form the focal point of Shiite polemical writings, along with, is along with issues of religious orthopraxy. The close comparison with some other versions of the Johanna story and other representatives of popular religious polemics written at the time will likely suggest further venues for understanding the shifting of Safi religious space, but that would require another occasion and cannot be undertaken here. Inasmuch as it was worked into the grand panegyric framework holding together Garibi's entire divan, uh, his story of Johanna was the product of a court culture perpetuated under Shah Ismail I and Tahmas, which was characterized by the Sufi intellectual outlook of the early Safavids and the heated anti-Sunni, anti-Ottoman, and anti-Uzbek religious polemics of the time. As I have hypothesized above, his version remained isolated from the rest of the renditions of the story, including the late 17th century version or versions, which follow different models. Garibi's work was the product of a highly versatile and multifaceted Safi religious discourse, ranging from the explicitly messianic to the, ex to the establishment friendly scholarly, to attempt at reform reformulating the mess messianic ethos. As is well known by the early 17th century, the Safi adventure greatly shifted orientation. Abbas's reforms meant fiscal, economic, administrative, and military centralization. An increasingly crystallizing Twerbashism had taken over from the popular religiosity perpetuated by the Qazilbash. To the present state of our knowledge, few religious treatises were produced in the 17th and early 18th century, i.e. the rest of the Safavids tenure. Just as much as the urban culture of, <coughs> of the Iranian city notables and bureaucrats was enshrined in the Persian literary and bureaucratic traditions, the nascent orthodoxy and orthopraxy was tra targeting the urban populace. And the Qizilbash military elite, and together with them, the popular Shiism with the heavily Sufi bent was quickly losing ground. 
Arguably, this brought about the diminishing of Turkic literacy, not in terms of its linguistic use in everyday life or popular <coughs> in everyday life or popular entertaining literary contexts, but in terms of its symbolic power. Thank you very much. My understanding is that this is the 14th such symposium uh, on the idea of Iran uh, at various stages and intersections of ancient uh, classical and medieval Iranian history. And while many here would likely agree that we can point to a general geographical space which constituted and perhaps con and does con continue to constitute Iran, the question of idea of Iran uh, should give us pause. It introduces some fairly complicated notions regarding how Iranian culture is conceived or understood, how Iranian culture is recorded, and how Iranian culture is preserved, perhaps we should use the word re-articulated, uh, during successive periods of alternating stability and extreme traumatic violence. The fact that there have been uh, 13 or now 14 symposiums thus far with dozens of insightful conversations on these issues tells me that there is no one overarching understanding of the idea of Iran, and nor should there be one necessarily. If we accept a, an amalgamative approach, I would argue that the idea of an enduring sense of bureaucratic corporate identity amongst Persians is an important and enduring one. The rubric of scholar bureaucrat, uh, in quotations, a term fashioned perhaps by our colleague uh, Jamal Kafadar, readily applies to those administrators who wore multiple hats in a typical medieval personal Islamic or Turco-Islamic uh, court. By the light of day, they filled and checked columns in financial deftars. They counted and double counted tax records, toured and assessed various iktas, and so on. By the light of candles at night, they worked on their respective labors of love, whether or not it was superlative calligraphy from Nizami's Khamse, a super commentary on Al Tusi's commentary on Ibn Sina, a regional history of Herat, a grand universal chronicle in the spirit of um, Khandamir, and so on. I would argue that such individuals believe themselves to be part of a greater historical corporate continuity, the men of the pen. Uh, and it was this sense of corporate continuity which inspired and motivated scholar bureaucrats to preserve and promote their idea of Iran. In their prescriptive model society, the men of the pen were essential to the maintenance of a sedentarized agrarian land-based polity. Without revenue based on systematic taxation, kingdoms and sultanates were inherently self-limiting and likely to collapse sooner than later. In this way, the ancient Sasanian idea of the circle of justice and its popularity in later uh, medieval and early modern political advice manuals was a testimony to the valency of administrators and state functionaries in regards to implementing tax structures and the maintenance of a, um, uh, a landed peasantry. So my small co contribution uh, here today to these questions focuses on bureaucratic culture at the height of the Safavid Empire during the first two decades of rule by Shah Abbas from 1588-89 to 1610-1611. And in particular, I would like to examine the somewhat unique career of one Hatun Beg or Dubadi, often referred to in the sources by his official nomenclature, the Ittamad al-Dawla, or the pillar of the state. And while Itamad al dawla may be better known to those of us interested in secretarial and vizierial culture, by and large, he is not represented significantly in contemporary scholarship about the Safavids. The Safavid period, and in particular the reign of Shah Abbas, is presented largely in, in modern scholarship in what I characterize as fairly empiricist terms. Uh, and what I mean here is a style of scholarly narrative which tends to privilege the Safavid ruler as not only the architect, but also the agent and overseer of all political, courtly, economic, and administrative policies and centralizing reforms. Uh, with the exception, of course, of matters relating to Islamic jurisprudence, philosophy, and theology, where personalities like Sheikh Baha'i or Mir Damad and others tend to loom quite large in the narrative. This approach has, uh, this empiricist approach, has no small impact on how we understand Safavid Iranian history during a period of considerable uh, change wherein centralization and state doctrine were be indeed being prioritized within uh, by the Safavids. Worth noting, however, is the very uh, recent publication of volume three of the Asal al-Tawariq, which of course Charles played an instrumental role in bringing to light. And quite interestingly, this text provides unique evidence with regard to Hatem Beg or Dubadi, which is not provided by Iskender Beg Munshi or other Safavid chronicles. 
So what I'd like to do today is to augment our understanding of this particular vizier, and in doing so, give us cause to reconsider the issue of bureaucratic agency at a time when Iran was, to quote Shola Quinn, uh, being refashioned uh, by Shah Abbas. Moreover, I hope to address, at least in a partial way, the aforementioned topics of corporate identity and the Ahle Kalam, along with their prescriptive self-designation as guardians and protectors of administrative culture in medieval Iranian history. Okay, so Hatem Beg is first introduced as part of the Safavid uh, political narrative during the first year of Shah Abbas's reign, 1588, and we are given a more fulsome family biographer, biography later in Iskander Beg Munshi's description of, uh, in the year 1606. And it is here that I'd like to begin and then I'll go back to 1588. Uh, Iskander Beg was a self-declared friend and confidant of the Grand Vizier and the historian gives a relatively detailed description of Hatem Beg's family and its prominence in the Nakhchivan region uh, uh, while, while narrating Shah Abbas's visit to the Vizier's hometown of Ordubad. And uh, so I just put this map up here to give you a sense of it, and I'm just gonna, oops, it's not going bigger. <laughs> there it is. Okay, so there's Tabriz, and there's Nakhchivan uh, to the northwest. The Shah had just concluded uh, a, a successful military campaign in Georgia, and was using his stop in Ordubad to plan and organize an upcoming invasion of Shirvan. In the following year, Hatem Beg invited Iskander Beg uh, to accompany uh, him to his hometown. And in a firsthand and fairly detailed fashion, Iskander Beg commits an entire section to Hatem Beg and his familial land holdings in the area. The picture that emerges from these respective descriptions is of a family of bureaucrats who demonstrated not only a history of serving the Safavid administration, but also boasted a formidable Shiite scholarly pedigree. These notable elites of Ordubad were known as Nasir Nasiriyas, and as such claimed direct descent from the 13th century polymath scholar and Shiite celebre Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. As both Sufi masters and Shiite emperors, the Safavids, first in Ardabil and later in Tabriz, were well connected with this region and it appears that the Nasariya notables served the Safavids on a client basis as early as the 15th century. The first named Nasir Nasiriya patriarch of note is uh, Malik Bahram, who had fled to Egypt around the year 1501 as a young man but was later invited by Shah Ismail to return to Ordubad. Uh, when exactly this happened is not clear, but we do know that, do know that Hussein Beg Lala, Ismail's vakil, had informed the Shah that Malik Bahram was a kinsman of Ismail's first chancery official, a person named Khaja Atik Ali. And it was Atik Ali who had first designed and affixed the Shah's Tugra. Tugra is kind of like a heraldic device that appears on, on official documents. Uh, he was the first to design and affix this to Shah Ismail's uh, first decrees. Shah Tahmas formally named Malik Bahram later as the Kalantar of Ordubad in the 1530s, while Mirza Kafi, another member of Malik Bahram's extended family, served as the uh, Munshi al Mamalik, which is a position kind of like the chief epistolographer, the writing of letters, uh, during the 1530s. As both uh, Qazi Ahmed and Iskander Beg Munshi noted, by virtue of their excellent service to the Safavid dynasty, the Ordubadis were found in the high offices of the royal court. This marked the beginning, in fact, of a new role for the Nasiriyas of Ordubad, serving as administrative guides for a new and ambitious dynasty which was in the midst of establishing a 12er Shiite polity. Hatem Beg was one of five male children who all served in various administrative and vizierial positions uh, for a wide spectrum of Safavid nobility and notables during the 16th century. All trained as secretaries and uh, comptrollers. The five were from oldest to youngest, Mirak Beg, Adham Beg, Hatem Beg, Abu Tarab Beg, and Abu Talib Beg. It was the middle son, Hatem Beg, who would become largely the most famous of Bahram's progeny and the only one to directly serve Shah Abbas. Hatem Beg cut his administrative teeth in the early 1570s in Azerbaijan by serving the governor of Khoi Dalu Budak Rumlu for roughly a year before eventually relocating to the distant city of Kirman following the turbulent reign of Shah Ismail II in 1576-77. And 
without getting into the somewhat complicated narrative of the late 1580s in the region of Fars and Yazd, in which prominent Kizilbash notables like Bektash Khan, Yakub Khan Zul Qadr, and Yusuf Khan Afshar were in various stages of conflict with the Shah and with one another. Suffice it to say, this was a critical stage for the recently enthroned Shah. By 1591, he had purged a wide swath of seditious elements in what I call his sovereignty showcase tour uh, through Shiraz, Yazd, and uh, Kerman. And he also began assembling the future elements of his new Divane Allah, his Supreme Council, uh, of which uh, included in this was, of course, Hattenbeg himself. Iskander Beg Munshi presents Hatem Beg in this period as a mediating force who is trying to convince his master, Bektash Khan, to respect Shah Abbas's decrees and to actually take up his uh, governorship in Kerman, which he won't do. Uh, so we have uh, Hatem Beg on one side. On the other side, we have uh, the large-scale property owner, sinister kingmaker, and general rabble-rouser, the Nimantalahi Sheikh, Mire Miran, who's depicted as a very kind of sinister, evil person who's giving bad advice to Bektash Khan. As Rudy Math Mathie has demonstrated in his uh, excellent article on the final stage of the Civil War, which appeared in Charles Melville's Festschrift, uh, these rebellions were as much about money and cupidity as they were about uh, loyalty and hubris. Moreover, Fazli Bey Khwazani, the author of the Asal Tavarik, uh, describes or details how sizable properties, treasuries, and court baggage were seized from various Afshar tribesmen after the death of Bektash Khan. The Namatalahis and the people of Yazd were also targeted for their disloyalty with extraordinary taxes and property seizures. It is amidst these developments that we read that the Shah arranged for Hatem Beg to be in direct royal service while in the city of Yazd. As various prominent positions were reshuffled in this purging time uh, in the Divane Allah, and new governors are being nominated throughout Iran, Hatem Beg was named as the replacement, replacement Mustafi al Mamalik, kind of the chief uh, uh, accounting officer. Fazli Beg uh, gives us evidence to suggest that Hatem Beg had indeed remained in Yazd in the months following Bektash's rebellion to oversee the political and financial reparation of the region. For instance, the Kalantar of Kirman, a person named Khaja Abdel Rashid, and various other regional notables arrived in Yazd with gifts and money to express their loyalty to, to the young Shah Abbas. These were presented to Ordubadi, who in turn remitted them, or so it said he remitted them, uh, to the central court in Kazvin. Likewise, various lords from places like Baum, as well as uh, Rish Safidan, white bearded ones or, or elders, who had been in the service of Bektash Khan in Yazd, uh, arrived and were reconfirmed in their positions by Hatem Beg himself. Ordubadi even embarked on financial assessments and reviews of the properties, the Amlak, of people like uh, that are named Shahriyari, Aka Zain al Din, and Mir Taj al Din Mahmud, who had all been servants of Bektash Khan, while also inspecting Nimatalahi properties and accepting cash money and gifts from Khalil Allah, the repentant successor to the evil Mir Miran. It was only when the vizier was stopped in Kashan during the winter of 1590, while en route to the royal court in Kazvin, that Ordubadi was officially proclaimed to be the Mustafi al-Mamalik, with appropriate pomp and ceremony. My suggestion here is that we often depict such centralizing initiatives as the one in Yazd, in this case a military uh, one, in fairly simplistic terms. A ruler suppresses a rebellion, executes the principal transgressors, and everything falls into order. What is interesting in this case is that we witness the ripple effect that the rebellion had with regards to the significant disruption as to finances and administration, but we also see how Hatem Beg, at least I believe, earned his first major nomination on account of his ability to smooth out these ripples and bring in various constituencies in and around Yazd back into the Safavid fold. Hatem Beg clearly impressed Shah Abbas when he arrived in the royal court in the spring of 1591. He was about 20 to 25 years his senior. Uh, he's senior to the young ruler. Hatem Beg uh, was referred to as Baba, not only within court documents, but also by Shah Abbas himself. And within six months of his earlier nomination to the Dar al Istifa, the accountancy office, Ordubadi was promoted again to the position of Grand Vizier and honored with the rank of the Pillar of the State. This would be the beginning of a 20 year relationship, a period in which the Safavid state would undergo most of its significant changes. 
While on the basis of my reading of the sources, Hottenberg should share at least some of the credit as he fulfilled a variety of roles, financial, financial comptroller, senior diplomatic envoy, military general, chancellery reformer, and auditor general. As a Nasseria notable, he also participated actively in the shaping of the official propagandistic profiling of Safavidshiism. In this way, uh, monarch and reformer work together in such a way that is perhaps reminiscent of, and here I, I could, uh, I'll probably risk uh, orientalism, orientalist, revi um, what's the term I'm looking for, uh, relativism, uh, by comparing it to someone like Henry VIII and, and Thomas Cromwell, uh, which was so well presented in Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantle. Um, According to the Afzal Tavarik, one of Hattenbeg's first assignments as Grand Vizier was to head up an um, uh, ambassadorial mission to Gilan. Um, at the end of 1591, to convince Khan Ahmed, the local potentate, to reconfirm his suzerainty to the Safavid house by agreeing to marrying his daughter to Abbas's son, Safi Mirza. Indeed, Khan Ahmed was already married to the sister of Shah Abbas. Safi Mirza had just been named as the Valiata, the heir apparent to the Safavid state, and also the governorship of Hamadan, and whose vizier was Mirza Abdullah Hussein, who was the nephew of Hattenbeg and future compiler of the epistolary Majmu'e, the Munsha al-Tusi. Obviously, the marriage of the heir apparent to this Gilani family, who had no male heirs, uh, was highly advantageous to the Safavids. And Khan Ahmed knew this very well, and he initially declined to the match on the premise that his daughter, Yukon Begum, uh, was legally a minor. As Devin Stewart has noted in his article on the lost biography of Sheikh Baha'i, a team of legal scholars, including Baha'i himself, produced a fatwa which allowed for this particular marriage. The presentation of this fatwa was charged to Hatem Beg and a fellow envoy by the name of Bistan Akaye Turkman. Interestingly, in the Afsal Tavarik, there is no mention of the fatwa itself, but simply that it was Hatem Beg's intelligence and canny ability to argue, which convinced Khan Ahmed to, quote, tie the knot between that jewel of the kingly crown with, with this prescient imperial pearl. The diplomatic concord appears to have been short-lived. Iskander Beg Munchi, who makes no mention at all of Hatem Beg's ambassadorial mission, simply narrates that Khan Ahmed had acted duplicitously with the Ottomans, and an enraged Shah Abbas ordered a major invasion and subjugation of Gilan in 1592. Two years later, the Afsal Tavarik makes uh, a note that 25 blank parvanches, already affixed with the royal Tugra on the white paper, which was blank, were given to Hatem Beg, and on each parvanche, an imperial order was to be written by the vizier and dispatched on behalf of Shah Abbas. Literally given blank slates in which to initiate policy, Hatem Beg's position is described uh, as unparalleled by Fazli Beg in the history of those men, uh, those men of the pen who serve emperors. It is with these parvanches in hand that Hatem Beg undertook a number of landholding assessments, um, Ars Ho, amongst emirs living in Arab, Arabistan, Kuya Giluya, and other regions of the south. Intriguingly, it was in the following year, 1595, that Ordubadi toured the recently conquered Kingdom of Gilan, and which resulted in a re restructured system of tax collection and land tenuring in this prosperous new province of the Safavid Empire. This reorganization was presented to the Shah in a, in a formal document, uh, translated as the Regulatory Ledger of Imperial Taxes, which is unfortunately now lost. We don't have it, but it's referred to. Hatem Beg's treaties so impressed the Shah that he ordered that it be used as a template for the remaining provinces of the empire. Clearly, Abbas's sustained military campaigns on numerous frontiers during this period played a central role in recalibrating the Safavid state. And after 25 years of territorial gains at the expense of the Ottomans and Uzbeks, the Iranians were now in control of parts of the Caucasus, eastern Anatolia, Iraq, Khorasan, and Khorazm. Post bellum, after conquest of a new province, it was often Hatem Beg who served as a diplomatic contact and mediator in many of these conflict zones. And for much of his career, he oversaw negotiations and brokered reconciliations with many non-Persephone communities as vassals of the Shah. 
Turks, Kurds, Arabs, Gilakis, Turkmen, Uzbeks, as well as Bakhtiaris and Kashkais. While his ethnicity is up for debate, he was likely an Azari Turk, he was fluent in multiple languages and was thus culturally and linguistically capable of handling the, di the diversity of the frontier zones of Safavid Iran. In 1594, he personally negotiated the semi, uh, the inter reintegration of the semi-autonomous region of uh, Huveza uh, in Arabistan, uh, while also dealing directly with the rebellious Afshar tribesmen of Kuya Galuya two years later. As mentioned, he took the lead in the reorganization of the Gilan province and its Gilaki speaking people after its formal annexation. In 1598 and 1600, respectively, he was the chief bureaucrat appended to the Shah's military uh, during two campaigns in Khorasan and Khorazm. Uh, and he, pers he personally brokered the surrender and vassal status of the Shibani Uzbek claimant, Nur Muhammad Khan. He played an important diplomatic role in the negotiated 1603 peace treaty with the Ottomans, and his last service before uh, dying in 1611 was an attempt to subdue the Kurdish region of Uromia while overseeing the conquest of the formidable citadel Domdom. However, arguably one of the most successful negotiations of this variety came at the end of his career in 1609, when some 20,000 Jalali uh, Turkish tribesmen rebelled against the Ottoman Empire, and they then decided to migrate eastwards to find refuge within Safavid dominion. Quote, it was royally decreed, writes Munajim Yazdi, that Itamad al-Dawla, Mirza Hatem Beg, go to Tabriz for the winter season so as to rank and appoint that group. Iskander Beg Munchi describes the enormity of this initiative in some detail and how Hatem Beg, along with notables, emirs, and teams of bureaucrats, orchestrated a sizable field operation in the environs of Tabriz to process, organize, and document tens of thousands of Ottomanized Turks who are now surfing the Safavid Shah. Royal, letter, royal letters and investigators were dispersed while elaborate role lists were prepared to enumerate these newly installed Turkish clans and their tribal leaders. Regarding chancellery culture, an, er, an arena of, in which uh, Hatem Beg was, was nominally in charge, and, and I've done some work on this area, I can state somewhat reasonably that the royal letters produced during Hatem Beg's tenure were not only shorter, but demonstrably less impressive as exercises in deliberative rhetoric and the use of literary devices and poetry. In these letters, which we can possibly, in those letters which we can positively identify as being written by Hatem Beg, some appearing in the Munsha al-Tusi, others being replicated in the Afsal al-Tavarik, there are textual admonitions against excessive prose to quote, hyperbole and prolixity is a violation of good cost, uh, custom. While certain short formulaic components of these letters were clearly being copied from uh, well-known manuals of epistolography, the most famous, I think, is Koshafi's Maxano and Shaw, which presents literally thousands of kind of model verses and titles that you can just kind of cut and paste and put into your letter. Um, these all combine to suggest that traditional perceptions of imperial epistolography, where letters could function as vehicles of debate regarding political philosophy, ethics, advice, as well as contemplative theology and theosophy, were being routinized with symbols, formulas, and rhetorical expressions, which conveyed, rather than explicitly arguing, concepts like sovereignty, like power, like obeisance. And then, in essence, it constituted a recalibration whereby chancery missives were now formalized and bureaucratized to such an extent that their deliberative and rhetorical function uh, were uh, the rhetorical function of arguing and persuading, celebrated for half a millennium by poets, literateurs, and philosophers, was being pointedly marginalized. I feel like this is cutting in and out, but I. While we encounter a linguistic downturn with respect to su style and sub substance, certain components of letters, seals, formulas, prayers, benedictions, signatures, actually grow in size and in complexity in the early 17th century. The Tugra had been in Timurid and Kara slash Akuyunu times at the top and center of a chancery missive. During the Safavid period, it was replaced with a different performative utterance, which was inked in gold and appeared as the beginning words in the first line of a document. Quote, a royal decree found the honor of being issued. Farmane humayun sharefe nefaz yaft. 
Different formulaic phrases were later introduced and popularized during the period of Hatem Beg's vizirat. Thus, Hukme Jahan Mota Shod, the world obeying order has happened, is a common feature in later Safavid documents, as is Farmane Humayun Shod, a royal order has taken place. Interestingly, as Bert Fragner has demonstrated, the official Safavid seal was moved by chancery functionaries from the bottom of documents to the top. And no longer were they round, they were pear-shaped, which was designed so that they could accommodate not only the name of the ruler, but also the names of the 14 immaculate imams. Um, and it's clear that it was part of a larger genealogical program by jurists and religious scholars to connect uh, these early modern kings with the prophet and his pre-eternal and infallible progeny. Safavid seals became increasingly complex and varied in terms of their design and text, and as such, one could argue that their diversification and use in multiple chancery spaces reflected the degree to which agents of state could operate independently of the ruler, but and still enjoy the full symbolic weight of his sovereignty. In an absolutist monarchical context, a chancery without access to some form of visual and recognizable imperial sanction cannot do business. In this way, the great seal, Mohre uh, Humayun, and you may think of uh, the successor to Charles James. Was it James who th threw the the seal into the river when he was trying to escape? That kind of great seal was uh, complicated by, or not complicated, complemented by smaller seals, Mohre Asar, which in turn could be affixed to signet rings. They would have these special rings with little seals on them, so that when documents came before them, they just could just very quickly put the phrase, literally, Hukme Johan Motashod, they would just stamp it onto the, onto the document with their special ring. Two of our more valuable 17th century sources which explicitly discuss the proliferation of seals, document typologies, and their varying formulas were both written by descendants of Bahram Mahalik, these Nasiriyas. One was Abdul Hussein Al-Tusi, who I mentioned, uh, who was prominent in the 1630s, uh, and he was a nephew of Hatem Beg. The other one is Abul al Qasim ibn Muhammad Reza Nasiri, who was himself the nephew of Abdul al Sayyid al Tusi, and he also served as the Majlis Nevis in the late 17th century. Their respective epistolary com uh, compilations, the Munshat al Tusi, 1633, and the Risale uh, Risale'e Davaran, 1669, 1676. Uh, Sandy Morton wrote a really good article about that when focused on that text. Both of these uh, these compilations contain explicit sections on the different seals used in the chancery. What's interesting is that Hotem Beg himself designed a series of new seals to herald the new imperial prof profile in the early 17th century. And just, I have to give a bit of backdrop before I can get to his seals. After a successful campaign against the Ottomans, Shah Abbas chose to show his piety and gratitude by performing a pilgrimage across Iran to uh, the massive Shiite sh uh, shrine complex in Mashhad. Uh, in the afterglow of this pilgrimage, Abbas decided, uh, decreed that sizable numbers of royal properties and businesses, primarily in Isfahan, were to be categorized as waqf. Uh, Munajam Yazdi describes also various waqf deeds that were uh, reenacted from previous Safavid family members, such as Shah Tahmas bin Shah Ismail, as well as other princely royals, including Sultan Muhammad Mirza, Sultan Hassan Mirza, Hamza Mirza himself, in places like Kazvin, Kashan, Mahmudabad, and Isfahan. A prodigious amount of money was generated according to the terms of these trust deeds, which were drawn up by Sheikh Baha'i, and the monies in turn were divided into 14 shares of various sizes. The largest share belonged to the Prophet Muhammad, and then so on and so on, smaller as they went down through the different imams. It should be noted, uh, perhaps coincidentally, that this new invigorated imperial piety by Shah Abbas came on the heels of his aforementioned visit to Ordubad uh, to visit Hatem Beg and his interaction with the Nasiri uh, um, uh, descendants. It was into this context that Hatem Beg and a chief religious overseer, or Sadra, named Mirza uh, Reza, together designed the 14 specific seals to be used for these new legal endowments. Hatem Beg ordered his chancery staff to research appropriate histories and Shiite hagiographies so as to recreate the signet seals purportedly used by the 14 imams themselves. 
According to Hatem Beg in the 7th and 8th centuries, the daily transactions, the Dado Satad, of each Imam were routinely blessed with their own personal seal. By recreating these seals, Hatem Beg claimed to be enacting the notion of deputyship, Neyabat, on behalf of the Imam's Holy Spirit. Indeed, the question of the pre-eternality of the imams, a subject of central doctrinal importance to medieval Shiite thought, was directly connected with this issue of imams' official seals. The 11th century uh, uh, scholar Sheikh al-Mufid had indeed quoted imami traditions that the angel Gabriel had handed the, to the prophet Muhammad a tablet which contained the names of the 12 imams. In another tradition, the angel delivered a folder containing 12 seals that had been created before time and were meant for each of the imams. In, uh, how am I doing for time? Okay, I'm, yeah, I, I should be good. In conclusion, <laughs> I would argue that an investigation of Hattenbeg or Dubadi raises certain questions and gives us pause to offer some tentative insights. First of all, I would remain somewhat convinced that Shah Abbas's policy of centralization and his ability to extend Safavid dominion beyond the Iranian plateau uh, facil was facilitated by Hattenbeg's ability to mediate newly subsumed individuals and groups while also assessing their socioeconomic worth through extensive reviews and assessments. The bureaucracy under Hattenbeg was tasked with ushering in a new era of centralization whereby extensive properties, cities, and provinces were classified or reclassified as private royal property and taxes and revenues reached unsurpassed levels in the 1590s and early 1600s. Concurrent with Hatem Beg's activities in this regard, the Safavid state was also expanding its Golam program in the Caucasus. Throughout the early 1600s, thousands of Georgians, Circassians, and Armenians were incorporated into the Safavid imperial project as new military leaders, as governors, as administrators, as courtiers. As Suzanne Babayi observed, and she can't, couldn't be here for this conference, so I quote her a few times to kind of try and make up for that. Um, as Suzanne Babayi observed, quote, they were uprooted from their indigenous socio-political networks. The slaves were transplanted into a reconfigured imperial court where they were invested through conversion with a new Muslim identity predicated upon Shiite loyalty to the Safavid state or to the Safavid Shah. Uh, this golam golamification clearly had an effect on the chancery, and the decision by Hattenbeg to simplify imperial documentary and epistolary language, uh, his decision to do so may have been a response to these new non-Persephone elements in the Safavid state. By the end of the Shah Abbas's reign, eight, eight of the 14 major provincial governorships were held by Caucasian elites. Chancery configurations and documentary output may very well have been shifted to reflect these new, ge new geopolitical realities. Again, as Susan Babayi noted, quote, the metamorphosis of Caucasian slaves into elite members of the Safavid household coincided with an official Shi language of authority that altered hierarchies of loyalty and consolidated a patriarchal family. I would add that much of the Shi language of authority was increasingly conveyed thanks to Hatem Beg through slogans, symbols, and routinized language. And here I'm talking strictly about the court. I'm not talking about what's happening in uh, religious circles or in madrasas uh, in Isfahan and elsewhere. Um, obviously, it's very complex. With regard to the question I invoked at the beginning of this paper regarding corporate bureaucratic identity and the idea of Iran, the landscape appears to only become further muddled. Uh, older paradigms of Perso-Islamic literary and bureaucratic culture, first formed in the Seljuk and Mongol periods, were now being fused with the theological and ju juridical demands imposed by the Safavid ruling family as custodians of this new 12-er Shiite state. I would argue that this marks the beginning of a diluted or perhaps even fractured sense of corporate identity amongst the Iranian bureaucrats, which did little, little to help conditions in Safavid Iran as it began to face more and more challenges internally and externally. Thank you.